talk today about sin. Sin that is in his flesh. Right? Sin the day we fight. We fight. Um, the sin, you know, that separates us from God, that prevent us over and over, right? To fulfill his will. That made us get lost away from our purpose over and over and over. But before I say that, I need to share this. Um, suffering. Suffering and pain. We all have a, a taste of that. And I know that as I speak right now, there's some people that, you know, you can you, you can portray Osiah. <laughs> wild, right? and, and, and put a show and appear that everything is going, that you're happy in life. But you know within you <coughs> that there is pain and suffering in there. <coughs> and pain and suffering is, you know, like when you come into the dream center, they call it a judgmental free song, right? This is what they call this church, and actually it is. It is. This church is this for this city. It's a judgment of free place. Did you talk a lot of this? Yes, I will, sir. In a but suffering, this world is not a suffering free zone. The life that we have in this human body that we all carry is not a suffering free song. You know, and I think that's why a lot of people, religion, offend them into a point that put them away from God and in resentment with God. And people get offended with God. Mm -hmm. Because religion is trying to sell you, right, a suffering free Christianity. You heard again? Religion is trying to offer you a suffering free Christianity and that is no such thing. There is no such a thing as a suffering free Christianity. Because when you look the Bible and where Christianity comes from and you look the man of God, right from the beginning you see suffering. Right from the beginning you see suffering in there. And you see men of God, devoted to God, giving the whole life fully to God, seeking God with all their heart, with all their strength, with all their soul, right? And still, in every life of these mighty men of God, you see suffering in their life. Because in this part, this is not a free suffering song that is suffering. The thing is, what do we do with our suffering? What do we do with it? You know, if you cannot stop the suffering, what do we do with it? <clears throat> it is what, what we can change. If we cannot stop suffering, the only thing we can change is the fact the suffering does in us. <laughs> like, if you cannot stop suffering, do you know suffering is a force? Suffering is a force. Both of doesn't suffering brought us to use? Mm -hmm. hmm? Doesn't suffering, us, suffering to make us to turn on all people that we love and our kids, our mothers, our father? It, it made us turn against them and go against what they want for our life. So suffering has a force within. <laughs> and the thing is, that's what we need to see. We need to get the wind, the force of suffering, and use the force of suffering to elevate ourselves rather than, rather than letting suffering bury us down. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you cannot stop suffering. It's part of this life. You see, it's part of this life. The thing is, what it makes a difference is, are you suffering by yourself? Or are you suffering with God? Hmm? 
That's what makes it difficult. Right? <coughs> the Bible talks about when Jesus was about to go to the cross. He knew that tomorrow in the today. You see, Jesus knew everything was going to happen before it happened. So when he's about, then he knows that the next day he's going to be crucified. He knew every detail of everything that was going to happen that next day. Every detail. He knew how it was going to feel when Judas came. You want to talk about Jesus loving the disciples? The Bible talking about John being the beloved. People say John was the beloved of Jesus, right? And Jesus loved John more than anyone. But I'm telling you something. <laughs> For you to give your bank account to someone, that had to be someone you really love. And Judas was the one that was the treasure, and he was the king in the back with the money. Judas was the disciple. He was the treasure. He was the one carrying the bag with the money. So that told me how much trust Jesus had in Judas. And that trust come with love too. And imagine when he knew that that next day, Judas, the one that he trusts with everything he had, was going to come the next day <laughs> to sell him out. Right? And betray him. And not only like that, because enemies, we all have enemies. But when the enemy is the one that kills you, mm -hmm. that hurts. <laughs> that hurts. Like when somebody in the street betrayed you and stabbed you in the back, you expect that. But when it's a loved one, a closer one to you, right? the one that kills you, that is painful. That caused suffering. That caused suffering. And you know what? Jesus knew that the night before it happened. He knew how Peter was going to deny him. <coughs> Peter. The one that he said, you're going to be a rock. You're going to be a rock. Peter, the one that said, no, I will die. I will go to jail. Peter, he, he already hear, hear the echo, right, of, Peter's, of Peter denial before Peter denied him. He knew it. He knew how everything was going to turn out. You know when somebody you know is going to do something against you, and before that person do it, you already know it, and before that person do it, you know that it's going to walk to that. That person is going out to sell you out. You're already feeling the pain before that person did. You're already feeling it. And he was suffering that in that moment. He was feeling that suffering. And the Bible says that he go into the seminary, right into the mountain. He was feeling all that. He knew everything was going the next day. He was stressed, right? Anxiety came over. Everything because, yeah, he was God. But he was God in the flesh. He was 100% God and 100% God. Human. The Bible says that he was tempted in every area, right? That he sympathized with every emotion that we feel because he told them all without sinning. So he was feeling like, what will you feel if they say right now that tomorrow they're going to come and arrest you? they got to whip you, right? They're going to whip you. They're going to put nails in your hands, nails in your feet. A crown of thorns. They're going to tell you your best friend is going to sell you out. Your other best friend is going to deny you. Everybody that's with you is going to run away from you. The same emotion that will go through your heart in that moment, the same thing was going on him. He was suffering. Right? He was suffering. And he was an anticipated suffering. He knew that the next day was going to even be worse. Because that was the anticipated suffering. But the next day, he was facing that suffering. Face to face. Face to face. And what he does? First thing he does, he goes to Gethsemane. He goes to pray. Because that's what we need to do when we are suffering. That's what we need to do when the pain is living inside of us. When we feel those emotions inside. What do we need to do? 
We need to run to the mountain. We need to run to God. We need to call to God with our suffering. Why? It's one of the things is. There is some suffering that you can put a stop to it. Right? There is some suffering that you can maybe not stop it, but alleviate it. Bring some, you know, uh, is that a word? Alleviate. Alleviate. You see? Learn the English. Right? Alleviate it. Right? But how? How? It is by going to God with it. And that's one of the first things that he did with suffering. He went to the mountain and prayed. Another thing that he did in suffering. And this is not the class. This is just, God is doing this, I'm going with it. I know it's not falling on the floor. I know that these words ain't falling in the floor tonight. I know that in my heart. Right? Another thing that he did, he didn't want to pray alone. He called some of the disciples with him. Mm -hmm. right? Because another thing we need to do when we are suffering right, is call out for others right, to pray with us for our suffering, to intercede with us. We need to reach out in our suffering. We need to reach out in our suffering today. I'm in pain today. I feel sad today. Right? This is so painful. But sometimes the enemy wants you to suffocate by yourself in your pain. The enemy wants you to suffocate yourself by yourself in your pain. He wants you to close you in your room, to lock you inside us by yourself when you're trying to deal with the pain. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong. Today I went to the funeral, right? In a this guy, at one moment in his life, was a Latin king. Also, his life, since I knew him, right? That's, he was, that, was, that was his belief, he was representing that. And in this funeral, right? Me and a pastor were doing the service, but his brothers came. And you know what? They were there. There were some people of his own family that wasn't there. But his brother came, they were there, Osa. And they were aligned, they were in an order, and they walked in with, with, with um, um, jail roses and everything. <coughs> to tell you the truth, they even prayed. Amen. They gathered around him and prayed. And prayed. We're a little crazy out there, a lot of little things, but, you know, but that's where they at. You see, that's where they are. I wasn't there to condemn. I was learning what God was telling me. And you know what I understood? That there is nothing wrong in unity. Because unity is power. What is wrong is what do you use that unity for? Mm -hmm. That's what's wrong. But it's nothing wrong in unity. Because unity is power. Right? It's power. And with suffering, the enemy want to keep you by yourself in your suffering. He don't want you to share your suffering with another person. He don't want it for you to put it out and say, come on, I'm going through this, I'm going through pain. Pray with me. Pray for me. Pray for this need. Pray for this situation that is killing me slowly every day. And that's another thing Jesus did. He took some of the disciples with him. Pray. Well, then another thing that Jesus did in Gethsemane, when he was having the anticipated suffering, do you know what he did in there? He prayed and he said, Father, please, let this cup pass you by. Now, you need to understand what this cup means. The Bible talks already in the Old Testament, right? About the cup of God's wrath. Right? It was like a sour drink like that. Like a king, when he wanted to put a wrath over a kingdom, over some people, it was a sour, right? A sour, uh, like a, a bitter drink, they put it in a cup. Right? Put it out. 
That was the cup of, of the wrath of a king. In the Bible talk about God pouring out, right, in the Old Testament, right? The cup, the calice, in the Spanish, in Latin, is the calice. It was a, a, a cup, a, a chalice. A chalice. We got a dictionary right here. <laughs> a chalice, right? So it was the chalice of God's wrath and anger for sin, right? The sour, you know when you go through something and say, man, now I have to drink the sour. <coughs> I'm drinking the sour, right? The sour drink of the consequence of my sin. I drink in the sour treatment that this person gave me to drink, right? So in that moment, Jesus knew that that's what was gonna happen the next day. He was gonna drink the chalice, right? Of God's wrath. That's why, remember Jesus in the cross, he asked for a drink and what they gave him? Huh? Sponge with water. Huh? No water. Vinegar. 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 You know, it's vinegar. And, and, and it's, it, it was a symbol of that. The vinegar is the sour, it's the wrath, right? The wrath of God. He was drinking the, the wrath of God over sin. He was drinking it for you. He was drinking it for me. What we were supposed to drink, the poison that we were supposed to drink, he was drinking it for you and me. Now, but the night before, that he was anticipating all the suffering from that moment that was going to come the next day, he prayed. And look at what he prayed. He said, Father, right, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. In other words, that's the cup that comes from my way to drink. Because every day you have a cup to drink. Every day in your life, there's a cup that you have to drink. It may be sweet what you have to drink today. It may be tomorrow what you have to drink is sour. It's sour. It's like a cup after cup after cup. Right? A cup after cup. But if the cup was coming to his way, he said, Father, if it is possible, please let that cup pass me by. In other words, then I don't have to take it into my mouth. Please, don't let this thing happen. Please don't let that person that I know is going to be trained tomorrow. Please don't let it happen. If it is possible, don't let it happen. Please, my wife is going to leave me and I know it. Please don't let it happen. My mother is sick and I know she's about to die. Lord, please don't let it happen. Let that cup pass me by. If it is possible. He asks for the torn. You know, when you got a torn in your feet, it's causing you suffering. He asked for the torn. In other words, he asked for the torn to be removed. Right? For him to be exempt. Is that the word? Exempt from that. Exempt. Exempt. Huh? Exempt. Exempt. exempt from that. He asked, at least, please, if it is possible, let me be exempt. Right? Of that sour drink that is going to cause me suffering. That's one, one thing that he asked. You know what he said after? He said, but nevertheless, your will be done. let your will be done in no mind. Mm. So the cup symbolizes a situation that is bringing you suffering. Right? The cup is what is being brought into your life. And willingly or unwillingly is going down to your throat. And it's sour, it's like vinegar. Right? And like we say, we live in a world, and maybe you find places like this, a judgmental free zone. Well, there's no life that you can find down here that it's gonna be a suffering free zone. Right? So he said, if it is possible, don't let me go through this suffering. If it is possible. Don't let me suffer that moment. If it is possible. But nevertheless, let your will be done. And no matter. That is the key right there. 
that is the key right there. Because if the suffering, it is inevitable, right? Inevitable. Huh? Inevitable. Inevitable. <laughs> right? <laughs> if the suffering is inevitable, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is inevitable. You have to drink it. Right? If it's not possible for that suffering, <laughs> for you to be exempt from that suffering, the only solution is to pray to God. Pray to God for what? To align our suffering into His purpose. That's the solution. To align whatever I'm suffering right now, the pain that I feel, right? I need to pray to align my suffering into His purpose. Say, it is inevitable for me to go through this. Right? It is inevitable for me to find a life without pain, without suffering. But God, I want to take this pain, I want to take this suffering, and I want your own will to be done with this suffering in my life. I want to align my suffering into your will. There's our sufferings in our life right now. There's things that I, I have sufferings. I have sufferings. That I cannot run away from them. The sufferings that you're trying to numb them with a pill, you're trying to numb them with a medication, you're trying to numb them with a illegal substance, right? You're trying to numb them with love, <coughs> with adultery, right? With greed. You're trying to numb that suffering with all these things, but that's all you're doing is numbing it, making it numb. Suffering is still there. When that suffering or that thing that you use to numb that suffering evaporates, the suffering is even greater because now it comes with a, with a crew, with a crew of guilt, shame, and everything else, mm. right? And all the losses, right? They come with it, right? So it's just numbing it. It doesn't heal it. It doesn't heal the suffering. It only numbs suffering away. Only numbing. So, the thing in life is, these are sufferings that we infiltrate those suffering to ourselves, number one. These are sufferings in our life that we infiltrate those suffering, right? Our, our decisions, right? Create those sufferings in ourselves that we are feeling today, right? Our own decisions. Well, you know what? It is inevitable. Suffering is there. You need to suffer for that loss. You need to suffer for what you did. You need to suffer for what you lost. Right? You need to suffer for what you carry in yourself now. Right? You need to suffer the memory, the haunting from that thing. But the thing is, if it's inevitable, you cannot go back. Right? And erase that. It's already done. So what do we have to do with it? We need to align that suffering into the purpose of God. Say, nevertheless, <laughs> it's here. Let your will be done. Yeah. Let your will be done in this suffering. Let your will be done. Yes, I don't want to go to it. I don't want to feel it. <laughs> but I, I don't have all the choice. So let your will be done in this suffering. The one that we infiltrate to ourselves. Number two, this is, there's another suffering that all the people have infiltrated on us. Suffering that is in our life because somebody wounded you. Because somebody betrayed you. Because somebody abused you. Because somebody took advantage of you. Because somebody hurt you. Because somebody abandoned you. Because somebody judged you. Somebody took you for granted. You see, suffering that it wasn't by your own infliction. You didn't inflict that suffering on yourself. Somebody else did. Can you undo what that person did to you? No, we can't. We can't get drunk to forget about it. <coughs> but the next day, the pain is still there. Right? 
That is some pain that to the day you die, you're going to feel. There are some pains that you're going to feel them and to the day you die. So what do you do with that pain? You connect and you align that pain into the purpose of God. Because when you take that pain infiltrated by yourself or inflicted by another person, right? You take that pain and say, God, here's the pain. Let your will be done in this suffering. Mm. Let your will be done in this suffering, through this suffering, and by this suffering. <coughs> Let your will be done. That's when you come and you bring to God the ashes. That's when you come and you bring to God the pieces that are scattered around. Right? That's when you come to God and you bring the dry bones. We see you. 37. You bring the dry bones to God. Say, God, let your will be done. Let your will be done in this situation. And you align your suffering with God's will. Look at what I say about suffering. Hebrews chapter 2. Right? Because sometimes we Christians, we think that as Christians we're not supposed to suffer. Right? We are Christians. Right? Christians means Christ-like. Right? Christ-like. And if we are Christ-like, how come we want to have a mentality that we're not supposed to suffer? Then in our relationship with God, the, the goal is to live a life with no pain and no suffering. My friend, that's a lie. That's a lie. Because if you are like Christ, the Bible says that we are in her, uh, here, co heirs, right? Co heirs, right? Heirs. Co heirs of his blessing and also of his suffering. The Bible says we are co heirs. That's something you inherit from him, too. It's not only the blessings, it's not only the Holy Spirit, it's not only the speaking in tongues, it's not only the joy and the delivery and the eternal life, it's also his suffering. It come with a package, like it or not. Like it or not. And if God said that we are coheres, coheres of the suffering, do God want you to suffer? To destroy you? No, I don't believe that. If God gives you that as an inheritance too, it's because that suffering does something good in you. Mm -hmm. Because God is not about to destroy you, that doesn't bring him pleasure. It doesn't bring really pleasure to not to see your crime because of the pain you feel inside. Well, like I said in the beginning, pain is a force, brother. Pain is a force. It is a force. I saw a video the other day that is behind right now. This guy was benching a lot. I don't know how much weight, but it was a lot of weight there. He got like four plates in each hand, only five plates. And he's benching by himself, and he don't have nobody in the back watching him. Oh, I watched that. You watched that? Yes. Right? And when that, he went to put it back. He did it. He lifted it, but when he went to put it back in the rack, right? Did he fall on his neck or something? Huh? It went right there in his face and his neck. All that way. And he's by himself. And, 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 and that is like that on top of his neck. And you can see his face, how red it got. Do you mind all that way right here? Right? But you know what I saw? I saw it in the same way that I saw all that redness in his face. That pain, I don't know for where, but that pain gave the strength to that guy to put that thing out and get off it. And get off it. The pain. Probably he wouldn't feel that much pain that he was feeling he wouldn't surrender to it. But that pain enabled him to fight. <coughs> that pain and empowered him with something that he couldn't do himself. Because that was crazy, he was like that. The whole thing was in his neck. So, if God gives us, right? If we establish that God, the Bible says that we are co with Christ, right? Of his blessing and also of his suffering. 
So then God is giving you pain as an inheritance. And God giving you pain to destroy you? No. That's not a God of love. So then, the problem is no pain. The problem is how we read pain. The problem is how we've been taught of what pain is and what it's for. You see, we see pain as the worst thing. But you know what? I don't know when you were a kid, one day you put your hand in the stove. Right? How many of you ever did that? I didn't. Right? Yeah. If nobody asked it. You really look curiosity, you went and put it there. Right? Do you did it again? No. Me neither. <laughs> Me neither. I remember in Puerto Rico they, they, they cook in the, the how they call it, the fogones. Yeah. Right? They, they put two rocks, right? Yeah. They made a fire. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. A right? Like It's like a grill, those grills in the, in the... When you go to the lake, they have those grills, you know, they, they like are... Like a battle? Huh? No. Like a battle? No, like those ones that they have at the lake, but except it's on the floor. Yeah, in the floor. <laughs> and, and back then, when they, you know, the poor people, like when I was a little kid in the 70s, they don't have, you know, people don't have a stove. Now they have whatever. Back then, they cook outside in the fire like that. And they don't let just anybody cook, you know, at that time because the fire is right there burning. They put putting like a little thing, you know, two blocks to hold the pot in yeah. there. And one day, I was, I remember this, I was a little kid and, and my mother was doing breakfast in the back. So I'm going in the back of the yard and she's frying eggs. And as soon as she said, don't get closer, but I didn't listen to it. And I grabbed the eggs and, and, and it got like a pan in there and the oil was hot. And I grabbed those eggs, cracked them up, and when I throw that thing in there, the whole thing, I don't know what happened, but the whole fire went in, the oil went in the fire, and it burned my two hands. Still today, I don't cook. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, now you know why I don't cook. <laughs> you see? But now you know why I don't cook. Because the pain in my hands, my both, both of my hands got burned. And that pain, I was running around. <laughs> Running around with my hands burning. But you know what? <coughs> That's what pain does. You know what pain does? It makes you run to safety. And that's what the devil does. He creates all these drugs, all these medications, all these things for you to not feel pain. Because if he keeps you from not feeling pain, he keeps you, not, not, never deal with it, but he also keeps you from running. The Savior. Is he? Not in the comfort. The Bible says that God gave us the spirit of comfort, the comforter spirit, the spirit of truth. And you see, the spirit of truth is that in John 14, the spirit of comfort, the spirit of truth. And you know what? The devil want to keep you in all kind of lies to comfort you in your suffering. Right? Lies. Lies of mentality, lies of drugs, alcohol, money, loss, pleasure, adultery, all these that, all these things are lies. The devil want to keep you in all those lies because if he keep you in the substitute, he keep you away of knowing the spirit of truth that it will really give you comfort in your pain. Right? One verse, he will still <coughs> And you know what? I'm loving this because I wasn't talking about that. I said I was going to talk about sin. I have a message of sin. This is just came and I'm going with it. Hebrews chapter 2. Chapter 9, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, right? <coughs> 2, verse 9. Hebrews 2, verse 9. It's talking about Jesus. When you read chapter 1, it's talking about the person of Jesus, the value of his person, you know, who he is. And in chapter 2, in verse 9, it says, What we do see in, what we do see is Jesus. Right? What we see here is Jesus, who was given a position. You know, he humbled himself. He was still talking about he humbled himself. 
I became flesh. He humbled three times, right? He humbled to become flesh. He humbled being God, the fullness of God. He humbled to become flesh. Then he humbled to become a servant because he wasn't born as a king in a palace. Right? He humbled for the second time to, to be a servant. And then he humbled himself to die and die on the cross. Three times he humbled himself. Right? And, and they say, um, we see Jesus, right, who was given a position a little lower than the angels. The one that created the angels lowered his soul for you and me to get a position a little lower than the angels. A little lower than the angels. And because, I, I wish everybody should have a Bible here to know that I'm saying this. It's right here. Hebrews 2, verse 9. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. How was he crowned with glory? How was he crowned with honor? By suffering death. You see, we want the glory and the crown, but we don't want the suffering. We don't want the suffering, right? And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tastes death for everyone. He tasted for everyone, for all of us. Verse 10, God for whom and through whom everything was made, God from whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. God chose to bring many children into that glory. The glory that he acquired through what? Through suffering death. God chose to bring many children into that same glory of Jesus. God for whom and through whom everything was made chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right, listen to this, it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering. It was only right that he, who's he? God. It wasn't the devil that made him suffer. And that's what we say many times. The devil is making me suffering. The devil is bringing all this suffering into my life. Listen to the word. Listen to the word. They say, and it was, and it was only right that he should make Jesus make him, to make him, to form him, to develop him. It was right that God to develop and form Jesus, right? And you say, form Jesus? Was he incomplete? In the spirit? 100% holy. 100% God. But he came to take a body that was incomplete because of sin, and he came to complete that body into the same stature of the holiness of God. You get that? He came to complete it. Man was incomplete. So Jesus came to, to God to form, to flesh, and take a flesh that is incomplete, and Jesus was uh, to align that flesh into the same fullness of holiness of the Spirit of God. That's amazing. That's the job that God did in Jesus. And when you receive Jesus in your life, and you surrender your life to Him, that's the whole purpose of our walk with God. Little by little, this flesh is dying, and little by little, it's like taming a horse. Little by little, this flesh keeps aligning until the day we die, and we are full in His glory. Amen? Amen. So, for God who through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory, and it was only right. That word, it was only right. So, is you suffering today? It was only right. I suffered today. I saw a friend, only 35, 36 years old. Yeah, 36 years old. I bury a friend today, and, and it caused me suffering. You know, I walk with my son, he cut my son's hair like, like three weeks ago, and I walk with my son, and I saw my son kneeling down to be able to see him face to face, and I saw my son crying while I was seeing him there. Sorry. 
Because my son is eight years old and he don't understand in the fullness of this. You see, I saw his little kids right, running wild without being able to comprehend. You know, when we brought this guy to the funeral, to the cemetery, I got his little son in my arms. And when they get, he said, but why they have to put him in the home? Why are they gonna put it there? And the case was closed and he thought that daddy was gonna come out right there. He said, but open the case, open the casket. Why they don't open the casket, a four year old? Telling me, but open the casket, open the casket. You know what? I want to suffer today. I feel so of suffering today. But in the midst of that suffering today, the gospel was preached. In the midst of that suffering today, the hope of heaven and eternal life was preaching there. In the midst of that suffering, people heard about Christ. In the midst of that suffering, even the Latin kings that were there, they were singing Amazing Grace. In the midst of that suffering, they sing Amazing Grace and everybody, even the Latin kings, everybody was singing Amazing Grace. I was crying, just hearing it. Hearing it. You see, in the midst of that suffering, right? Because suffering is inevitable. It is unnavigable. But you can use the force of suffering right, to perfect something. You can use the power of suffering to perfect something. It's right here. And it was only right that he should make Jesus <clears throat> through his suffering. Look at how he made Jesus through what he suffered. It was only right that God would make Jesus through Jesus suffering, a perfect leader. I like in this verse. You hear this? That Jesus became a perfect leader through his suffering. Thank God for everything I have suffered. And everything that I'm suffering today, and everything that I will suffer. Because it is right. God see it right. Right? To, to perfect me suffering. Jesus was perfected through what he suffered. Why? Because when you get suffering and you align your suffering to the will of God, God used that suffering to perfect you. That that would inflict suffering to destroy you. That that would inflict suffering to offend your heart. That that would inflict suffering and he make you think that God is making you suffering to destroy you. God ain't doing that. You know, God ain't doing that. The devil want to make you feel that, right? To destroy you. When you think that suffering, and you align it with the will of God, and you say, God, be glorified through the suffering. Use the suffering to draw me closer to you. Use this suffering for me to die to the flesh, for me to die to my own will, right? For me to die to my selfishness, right? For me to die to my own plans. And use this suffering for you to perfect me into the man and the woman that you thought in your mind. Amen. Aligning our suffering with the purpose of God. And it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering a perfect leader. Look at how he made it. He made him into a perfect leader. There's many leaders right here. Because everything that you have suffered is a sign that God have a leadership in your life. Everything you have suffered is a sign that you have a leadership calling from God. Do you hear that? That the suffering in your life it's a sign that God has a leadership calling in your life. Because do you consider me a leader? Huh? Yes. I suffer. I suffer. Jeff, you are a leader. Do you suffer? Absolutely. So suffering is a sign that God has a little cheap call for your life. Take that. If anything is being saying here that you're going to take, take that. And when you see you suffer, you say, wow, God is turning me into a leader. God is turning me into a leader. God used this suffering to mold me into that perfect leader that you're going to make out of me. But don't let the suffering 
make you run to other conflicts. Don't allow. Don't let the enemy use the suffering to blame it on God with the purpose that God is bringing suffering to destroy you. No. The suffering that God allows in your life is to perfect you. Is to perfect you through suffering. Almost done. And it was only right that he should make Jesus through his suffering a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. Mm. The suffering that me and you go through, it made us fit to bring others into salvation. You know why I suffered a lot? And I still suffer. But I suffered a lot in my using. I suffer a lot every time I want to stay clean, every time I want to do the will of God, and I keep falling back and falling back and falling back. Every time I want to be a father for my kids, and I keep falling back and falling back. Every time I want to be a good husband for my wife, and I want to keep falling back and falling back. You know what? I suffer a lot through all that. But when I turned that suffering into God, He made me fit to meet, bring many into salvation. Because in the midst of that suffering, I met the true comfort. I met God. Mm -hmm. I met Jesus. I met the Holy Spirit. Through that suffering. Maybe if everything would be going right, it would have never came to Him. But that suffering, it brought me to run to safety. So I know, I don't go to ask for you suffering. I know that everybody here suffering. Because you ain't suffering something, you ain't human. If you ain't suffering something, you're dead. But tonight, you can say to God, God, I haven't been able to undo this suffering. I haven't been able to stop it. Yes, I've been using many things and doing many things in my life to numb it, but it doesn't go away. I surrender to this suffering today. And God, I ask you to align this suffering with your purpose in my life. Because the purpose of God is not to destroy you, but the purpose of God is to give you life and life in abundance. So let's stand up, all of us. driving a Rolls Royce, but when they go to bed, you don't know the tears that they cry that you don't see. You know, but we don't see those tears that they cry that we don't see. You know, the reality is that every person in this world suffers. You know, that we try to hire and cover it up and live in denial, yes, that's the plan of the enemy. The enemy wants you to deny your suffering. The enemy wants you to cover up your suffering. Because if you don't expose your suffering, it doesn't go to lead you to go to safety. It doesn't go to lead you to meet the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God, that will bring comfort into our life. You know? So the reality is you can see these people, but we all know to suffer. The thing is, sometimes that suffering is the force that led them to get all that money. <laughs> to get all that fame and to get all that thing, but it's still, it's just numbing, it doesn't heal the suffering. Mm -hmm. Only God had the spirit of comfort. No one else. Amen. No one else. And only God can take the suffering in all of us to develop us into that leader that He wants to make out of all of us to bring many <coughs> to salvation. But I don't know if you want to agree with me, right? But let's lift our hands to God today. And I say, God, 
Take our suffering today. Take our suffering today. We surrender to it. We, surrender to it. we admit it. We are no longer going to deny it. For no today in agreement, today. we pray to you pray for your will, your will to be done, to be done through, our through our suffering. For you, for you to use the suffering, use the suffering that, is heart, that is in our heart, in our mind, in our, mind, in our, emotions. In our emotions. Use it, use it to perfect.